Just think of it as the rough draft of the podcast world. This is the Newbie Writers Podcast with your hosts, Damian Boat and Catherine Bramcamp. Hey, welcome to episode 163, where I can tell you right now, my dress is golden white. <laughs> and I think mine is too. And our guest, Molly, also decided it was golden white, correct? What? Correct. <clears throat> that means, there you go. That means we can We're put all it wrong. Different. Or what? <laughs> I know, it's all actually, wrong. It's actually green and purple. <sighs> yeah. That, oh, see, there you go. <laughs> I worry about this now. We're going to end up with all these crazies coming out going, it's pink. <laughs> well, that would be refreshing and it would be different. Mm, anyway. Mm. So we're back after we're back after a, a short hum, hiatus due to weather. Mm, weather and Tell illness. Tell us about the weather. Weather's been rubbish. Um, <laughs> look, I live in Australia, but it shouldn't be that hot. That's just stupid. You have crazy. You have crazy hot weather now in California. It has been pretty much perfect. It's been like high 60s. I've been sitting outside and eating. The dog and I are laying out in the sun and getting early sun on our pale, pasty skins. That would be both of us. Mm. Um, and it's wonderful. And then all I can think of is poor Boston underneath a, a bazillion inches of snow. Well, I don't know. Like, how come like, people are in war at the moment? How come California's never been invaded? Gone, well, let's pick somewhere nice and sunny all the time. It was. It was by the... Um, the uh, Spanish, oh, because right. it looks a lot like Spain. <laughs> <laughs> hit, the, hit the coast and said, "Wow, it looks like home. We're going to raise some wine. We're going to kill all the indigenous people. Woo, we're there. You got it. Seems That's yeah. a good description. But we are slated in California for forest fires. That was in the paper today, mm -hmm. and also for an earthquake. We always have to remember there's an earthquake. So. Whenever I start to feel guilty about Boston, I remind myself that we do get our little share of troubles, just not as many as they get. No, and ours, at least the earthquakes are often warm. I, that's a, I don't know you, about you, Molly, but we know a lot of natives have a concept or a, a thought about earthquake weather, as weird as that sounds. And so about October-ish, because that's when oftentimes we get hit, you look around and everything's really still, the sky's really blue, there's a World Series, and you think, uh oh, here it comes. Right, <sighs> right. Well, but that's the only war we don't get any warnings. That's what I like about California is that we just sort of party like it's 1999 because we, there's no like we, we don't have anything that like says, guess what? Big fire tomorrow. <laughs> so we just Yes you do. It's always a surprise. Our natural disasters are always surprises. Don't you have some bear? Some I don't know. Isn't that part of the advertising campaign? The bushfire bear or whatever it is? Smokey the bear. Yeah. The right. bushfire bear. Now I love that. <laughs> the smoky goes down under. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. Because yeah, we don't call them forest fires. We don't really have. Yeah. Anyway, um, I don't know. That's <laughs> the bushfire bear is great. That seems a bit silly, though. It's sort of like, hey, kitties! I'm a cuddly bear. By the way, it's on fire. Anyway, um, <laughs> no smoke. Oh. Smokey was more. He was. He uh, was very serious. And he had his little ranger hat on, and you know, and Smokey, Smokey would admonish us to not play with fire. Right. So there, that was I, that. Our whole childhood was, you know, don't play with fire, which is as is in your country. That's a big deal in California. Molly's hmm. right; it's the fires. Well, the yes, last weekend it was melting hot, and I said to Sharon, "I think I might do a barbecue," and she looked at me and went, "Is that really wise?" There you go. And I, and I went, "Well." I'll have a bucket of water next to it. Anyway, anyway, we're not here to talk about <laughs> cooking. Um, Enough for me. <laughs> we have we have a very very good author and guest on. We have Molly Giles on. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. What? Although I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there another way to say it? Um, yes, Giles. I think because you come from. Yes. A British background, you know how to pronounce it, but it's usually Heles or Gills or Childs or I don't care because it's my first husband's name and it still embarrasses him to have me use it. So Ooh, um, cool. I don't I don't have anything attached to it, but it is Giles and not many people say it correctly. Thank you. Hey, Heles? Really? It's, it's California. Again. 
He leaves. Yeah. I can, I totally can see that. No, 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 that's wrong. Can you, put, whoever says that, can you put them on to me, please? That's just, there's a G. There's a G in it. You say that's it. because we live in a place where San Juan is one of our cities. I suppose. San Jose. And you also forget. That's, so they just, they, yes. that's the way our GPS pronounces it anyhow. <laughs> And, oh and you guys tend to forget the H in herbs too, by the way, yeah, just to point do. that out. Mm. <laughs> anyway, so why are you on our show again? Let me have a look at the notes. Hang on. <laughs> One of the reasons that I asked Molly to come on is that uh, Molly and I were at a, um, a book reading or mm. a story reading together a couple, about a month ago, and I was so charmed with Molly, with the, the uh, selections that you delivered in your from your upcoming collection in all the wrong places that I thought I need to talk to you because I just loved your your wit and I loved the attitude of your pieces and then you know bonus you teach how to write short stories and so we want to talk about that a little bit and what you have to say to newbie writers on how to write really killer awesome award-winning short stories that sounds very delightfully nice of you. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to address to address all of those. So. My pleasure. So, what is your um? So, tell me about like your first your your first collection and what drew you to the short stories. And and I and I say this as someone who writes everything but short stories. So I'm I'm interested in that and that art form as something that I I really don't do. Well, I, I was writing poetry all during my 20s, and it was just pathetic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's no other word for it. I loved Wallace Stevens. I loved T.S. Eliot. I mean, these were guys that I had nothing in common with. And then mm -hmm. Sylvia Plath, of course, came along, and um, Anne Sexton, and they also um, spoke to me. But I couldn't. I wasn't crazy, and I wasn't suicidal. So that cut, <laughs> you know, a huge hunk of material off. Mm -hmm. And so much so, of that ended badly. So, you know, this kind of not <laughs> a model to pursue. Mm. <laughs> it was a long, it was a hard time for me. So um, yeah. when I was in my, when I was in my late twenties, I um, was living um, in Sacramento. It doesn't mean much, but it, I felt sort of cut off from my, my life. Actually, I was um, a housewife with two children and I took a, correspondence course in the short story from a um, University of California at Berkeley from a woman who wanted everything to be only 500 words and it was oh. the best training I ever had I never met this woman she since passed away but I would do my assignments religiously and mail them in and the very first story that I wrote for her um, very first story I ever wrote was picked up by a, a sort of what we used to call a teeny bopper magazine. It was called Ingenue. Mm -hmm. And they accepted my story. They paid me quite a bit in those days. I think it was $300. And then they went out of business. And this was, sort of my, this was sort of my uh, my life for a while. I would get accepted and then the magazine would bite the dust. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they gave you all their money. <laughs> <laughs> I took the, um, the story that had been accepted and I applied for a scholarship at the Squaw Valley Community of Writers, which is oh, yeah. a wonderful venue up near Lake Tahoe. And it's a week long um, workshop atmosphere, mm. we, sort of, we called it Squalid Valley. I mean, there was a lot <laughs> going on up there besides just teaching writing, but um, I got a, scholarship, got a scholarship up there and um, began to take myself a little more seriously, not really, but somewhat more, and then gave up poetry just in the nick of time and <laughs> have been writing, been writing short stories ever since. I, I wrote one novel um, and I just finished another, which I'll um, mail off to my agent tonight, mm -hmm. but I don't like the novels as much. I like reading novels, but I don't like writing them. I like writing short stories, but... Um, because I like to see the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, just quickly, as you know, and Catherine yeah. also teaches in the university, uh, have you, has it ever crossed your mind to go, you know what, I, I cannot be bothered reading all of my students' work. I'm just going to cap them at 500 words because it's easy. <laughs> I have a feeling that's oh. what it was. <laughs> mm. I'm surprised you haven't thought of that before. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why, five, why 500, you know, 15? 1,500 yeah. or just 15 words? 
Yeah. I mean, really get them to condense. Students are so, well, verbose. they're plagiarizing. A lot of them are plagiarizing anyhow, but they're, they're just so verbose. Um, yeah. So well, I, I love, I love flash fiction and I think it's mm -hmm. a wonderful exercise for students to uh, condense, not wander all over the map, but it takes revision. Mm. My favorite yes. quote, Okay, my favorite quote, it's disgusting, but I love it. Mm. Oh, it's, well. from Ray, it's from Ray Bradbury, mm. the science fiction writer. And he said, throw up, then clean up. And <laughs> I just think that sums it up, you know? So they have I to get that. it all out. They have to get it all out on the page, but you don't have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. this is the thing, though, just as a sidetrack, why is there word counts I mean, with your assignments? Like, why not just have a, when it comes to this, say, look, I need. I want you to write a paper on this topic, and you'll get the odd idiot that'll be like, "Oh, I can only write a hundred words." Fine, and then you'll get the others that'll write more than that. But it seems that when you say you need to write a thousand words, five thousand words, everyone gets to that point when they're like, "Hmm, I need to have like a million ands in this paragraph to try and pat it out." It seems pointless. So oh, is that, is that how you teach, um, Damien? Do you assign them to write a, a two thousand word essay? Et I don't. I don't teach anyone. Oh, actually, no, I've got an apprentice. But um, no, for like because Catherine's in the university. Yeah, yeah I do. I I think part of what I do is is one of the reasons you want a word count is that students really want to have very specific parameters, and so it it doesn't help them. And and I'm I'm teaching academic essay as opposed to a creative writing class. But mm -hmm. what, I, what I tell them is, all right, if you can say everything that you need to say, if you can cover all of this and it, the word count is short or goes over a little bit, I'm fine with that. So I give them the parameter and then say, if, you know, if you can nail it, great. But what I don't want to see is exactly what you said, Damien, mm -hmm. which is I need to, you know, amp up my, my word count. So let's just throw in very you know, into every <laughs> mm. paragraph, see if we can get those words up. I, I try to discourage that on a lot of levels. Yeah. Well, teaching, teaching creative writing is so much easier than teaching the academic essay. I, yeah, I just cannot, probably, I cannot yeah. bear, I cannot bear to read student essays. I just, I have an allergy to it, but the stories, I just give them free reign. I say they can write anything they want on any subject in any length, as long as they get a beginning, middle, and an end. They have a character in conflict and, um, you know, use words beautifully. And, um, and I've gotten some wonderful stuff that way, but teach, I could never be, whenever I tell anybody that I'm a professor, they immediately assume that that means an academician, which I can't even pronounce. Um, <laughs> Creative writers are, we're not very bright. And um, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I have the patience to read a, a student essay. Um, yeah, it's, it takes, you have to, you, it's like you have to, um, you have to you know, work up the muscles, so to speak. And, and you have to know what, what I do is I know what I'm looking for. So I'm, I'm, what I do is I look for that glimmer of a got the subject matter, they understood how to express it on a certain level. And then I just simply work with them on how to express it better, as opposed to spending lots of time redlining every single thing in their essay, which is something that I agree with you, I don't do. I don't have that kind of time. And they're not going to read it anyway, to be honest. No, they, they don't read it. <laughs> so, uh, There's nothing they're just going to say, well, got to be in the route. So I, <laughs> then you see it thrown into the waste paper basket with all your right. careful marks on it. Yeah, no. Right. Hmm, well, we should have another. So what do you think? Let me ask about that. Um, what do you think is the difference, or you know, why you're drawn? Why are you drawn to the short story versus the the novel? What are some of the essential differences that you see? Well, the short story. I think the short story is is actually sort of closest to the joke. It's um, it it re it it requires um, it requires a punchline or some sort of um something at the very end, whereas a novel is more like, oh, you live with a novel. You take it out when you go out to lunch, you stick it in your purse, you, mm -hmm. you read it in, in bed, you, um, you live with it. And, and so it, it's more leisurely. You, you don't have to, um, I, I, I just love being in the world of a novel. I've always felt that the short story form is essentially punitive. It's, um, it's in there to wake you up. To make you see things differently. I was thinking of the short story writers I like so much, like Flannery O'Connor. I mean, she was mean as shit. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, 
and 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 you always felt like you were getting sort of hurt at the end. I, I can't describe it any better, but I think a short story is there to make you see things differently, uh, sometimes painfully, sometimes as in a John Cheever story, for instance, beautifully. Um, whereas with a novel, it just sort of permeates your, you always remember where you were when you read a novel. Mm. And I don't think that's so true of a short story. Because usually you were on a commuter train or <laughs> yeah. someplace, someplace not very interesting. But novels you take to the beach, you know, yeah. you take them to the Yeah. Yeah. With short so stories, that's though. not that's not really explaining it. I think that the novel is essentially kinder. I think that's what I'm saying. It's kinder than mm. the short story. Kinder. Oh, I like that. Well, with with short stories, though, um, at the core of it, how do you go about you know, telling a story um, without like cutting it too short? In a sense of you cutting out a lot of the fluff. You know, and there's you know, backstory and deviations. How do you go about doing that to make sure it's quite focused, but so you don't leave the reader going, well, hang a minute. Well, you throw up first. <laughs> <laughs> you get all that out, you yeah. know, and then you see whether it fits or whether it doesn't. And and some of it should fit. It should uh, embellish the story. So you don't have to weed so ruthlessly. Hmm. Um, but I think if you don't get it out, um, then you're really missing, you know, if you're, if you're too tight and too controlled, terrible. Mm. Um, so I think being really loose and of course the secret you hear it, we all hear it again and again, and it's true and I hate it, but it's revision. Mm. It's like, <laughs> I'm always wanting to lose weight and I think, oh yeah, I should eat less and exercise more. I mean, I hate that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and with, with writing, you should revise, revise, revise till you get the story that was in your head or the poem or the essay that was in your head when you started to write, which mm. is so hard to capture. Uh, the very first book of short stories I wrote was called Rough Translations because you have this idea in your head of what it's going to be. And then everything, every attempt you make is sort of a rough translation of what you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Well, so. I'm seeing a big trend lately. I've been you know, reading the odd thing here and there. And I don't know if it's just me being me. But it seems that a lot of people are using very short sentences and I'm finding it hard to read. Like, yeah, there's been a couple of things. And it would just be, he stood there, full stop. He turned, full stop. I'm like, oh, I don't. Can we put, like, and in there somewhere? Like, just to, <laughs> I don't know. I feel myself reading dot points. And it's almost like, well, this is a short story. I've just got to hammer out each little point. I think well. that can get really, really tiresome. And mm. and one thing I ask my students to do is to read everything they they've written out loud to themselves. And once they start to hear that boom, 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 mm. they better change it. And one good thing is a real make them read Faulkner. You know, they just have oh. to lock themselves up in a room and read two pages of Faulkner, and they'll be okay. <laughs> Um, their, gross, their grocery lists will go on and on and on, you know, whatever. But um, it's it's sort of a stylistic trend mm. right now. But it, I agree with you totally. I don't like that punch, punch, punch. Do you think? It's and a, a lot of it too. I love television, but um, my students are very good at dialogue. They're very good at action. Mm. They're not very good at internal thoughts because um, TV doesn't do that. You know, the actor's face will show it. But if you don't do it through the dialogue, and the books that I grew up on, I mean, the the Dickens, the Trollope, all that stuff, it, it really went into what people are thinking. Hmm. And my students don't know how to do that. <laughs> they haven't learned. Do you think it's a product and, uh, of, uh, like, text messaging and, you know, social media where we've got to get out that sentence in only 160 characters or whatever it is? Right. Um, and then that just slowly but surely translates into our writing. So it is very just that's i call it staccato it's very short and sharp um and stupid you don't yes. get you don't get anything you find out what they had for lunch or you know who they like or what they don't like but you don't get anything deep you yeah. know so yeah. frustrating yeah. frustrating but my students were starting to talk in text i retired actually a few years ago because i couldn't take it anymore they were they they didn't like paper they don't like books they were bright students, mm. but they were using PowerPoint. Uh, I remember uh, one uh, class presentation was on a, a, a writer that I like very much, um, Kevin Brockmeyer. But instead of 
talking about the story, they put it on PowerPoint that had music, it had a cartoon, it had a voiceover, and then at the very bottom of the screen, there was a little dark, I don't know, it looked like a smudge or something, and that was called print. <laughs> oh. Right. <laughs> and that's when I thought, you know, I think, I think I'm too old to be teaching. I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. So, uh, But I've had some wonderful students, and they've written some really good things. I'm very proud of um, the students I've had. So, Have you said But I think it's – storytelling will always be storytelling, but it goes to different, different media. Have you, have so, you ever said uh, to a student, hey, I really like what you've written. I think you should be putting that out there. You know, send it to a publisher, that sort of thing. And have they then had success basically based well, on you pushing yeah. it out there? Uh, well, with one, that doesn't happen very often, I have to admit. But um, Amy Tan, the Chinese-American writer, is yeah. one of my students. And I met her, I had mentioned going to Squaw Valley um, as a young writer. And then I went again as a teacher um, a few years later. And Amy was one of my students. And she turned in a 12-page short piece that uh, in her mother's voice that was so fresh and interesting and a mess. It was a total mess. And I <laughs> sat down with her and, and said, you know, I think you've got about like 12 different short stories in here that you could bring out and make a collection of stories. And she said my favorite word that I love to hear from a student, which is okay. <laughs> and uh, we, we worked together the next uh, year and um, that's how the Joy Luck Club um, was born, actually. And that was, to me, a combination of joy and luck because uh, Amy was such an eager learner and um, had she had the imagination and the skills, but she didn't have, um, she didn't really know how to organize her material or put it together. So um, the Joy Luck Club, to me, remains a wonderful book, and I'm very mm. proud of it. And I've worked with Amy on all of her books since, all of her fiction books, not her nonfiction. Wow. Um, well, that's very cool. Since. So I still remain her editor. But, you know, there haven't been, in all my years of teaching, I often think that maybe with luck I'm making students be better readers. Um, one of my students at the University of Arkansas which is where I taught for 14 years, is writing the, um, this wonderful TV series called True Detective. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick Pizzoletto, I can't really take credit for it because Nick only took one of my classes, but he, um, <laughs> he was my student, and he's gone on to do this wonderful HBO series. But in terms of really you know, making money, um, becoming household words, I'm afraid not. My students go on to publish in little literary magazines. Mm. All too often, they become writing teachers, which is sad. Oh, um, what's wrong with that? that? <laughs> <laughs> they're adding. They're adding to the general beauty of the world and the goodness of life. But are they getting, you know, swimming pools built in their front yards? I, I don't. I don't see it yet. So yeah. Well, you've been nominated and won a number of awards. How how do you deal with that? Like if they. You know, you have to sort of do your little speech or something like that at the end of it. Do you have a stock standard? I'd like to thank my agent and my cat. <laughs> I don't know. I've never no, won anything. Frankly, I don't think my agent is listening, but my cat has been a lot more help. <laughs> 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 uh, no, I don't. I'm not very good at giving speeches. I won something that just thrilled me. It was the national, okay, it's a big word. It's the National Book Critics Circle Award for book reviewing. This was back in 1991. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of book reviews and I had the good fortune to be sent a book by uh, a woman who had slept with both uh, Jack Kerouac and with his friend, uh, Neil Cassidy. Uh, and, uh, at the and same also time? By, <laughs> and also by, at the same time, and a biography of uh, Faulkner by a guy who was mainly interested in the size of Faulkner's male organ. Oh. So I was able to go to town on both these books because they were just, I loved, actually, I love Carolyn Cassidy's book. I will say that. It was a lot of fun. But, um, but I was able to be playful. And I won the, this wonderful award the same year that they canceled the money. that They used to give $1,000 to it. <laughs> Oh. But they flew me to New York. I got to sit next to John Updike, and I got to give a little speech. And I, I did give a speech then about the pleasures of book reviewing, which is that you can uh, write all over the book. Uh, you can uh, 
um, you can abuse the book. You can, you know, say anything you want to about the book. It's it, just the freedom of it. But, um, but that's the only time I actually remember having to give a speech, mm. and um, and I didn't like it. Well, except I made John Updike laugh, and that was worth it. Totally. <laughs> that's the main thing. I mean, with the book reviews, I don't know. I've I struggle with book reviews. They seem to be so but black and white. You've got all of their friends going, this is amazing. And then you've got the other half that go, this was terrible. Yeah, it's hard. I don't know how to do it. I, I would never, ever review a book, and I did it for years for the uh, LA Times and also for the New York Times, but I would never review a book written by a friend or yeah. by anybody I even knew. Um, I just don't think so, but you do that. In it, that seems, yeah. it seems, yeah. In that larger space then for the, the newspapers and whatever if you've got a book in front of you it's by sort of a fairly well-known author and you you start to really get two chapters and you go wow this is a train wreck i, mean, <laughs> I need to review this by the end of the week um can't you just say that well this was my question have you ever then had you know like the editor or the boss or you know marketing come and go look you can't do that we need to tone it down a bit or have them retaliate, the author going, you can't say that about my book. Well, I don't know. I just say what I think. And it's never gotten me very far, but um, <laughs> but I would never. <laughs> you, do, you do have to. The, the worst books of all, Damien, are the ones that are neither good nor bad. Mm. They're right in the between. They're boring. And, and no matter how you do it, you're going to write a boring review. And... Um, it's like it's like the quality of the book comes and infects you. If a really good book you can be very enthusiastic about, a very bad book you can be quick about and and um, you know funny uh, mm. without being too cruel. And um, but those mediocre books, oh my gosh, I would spend weeks puzzling over those. How to get a review out that sounded readable, mm. even though the book wasn't. So. so. Do you did you have to try and put some sort of positives in there going, well, it started well, you know, that sort of thing? Of course. And usually when you read reviews now, it's like they're all positive until the very last paragraph. I'll often jump to the last paragraph because I just want to see that's when the reviewer will finally say, you yeah. know, the sentences were only three words long or, you know, <laughs> yeah. whatever, uh, whatever yeah. was irksome about it. But we don't have many book reviews anymore. The, the San Francisco Chronicle used to have a big book section, no more. The San Jose Mercury used to have a big book section, no more. They really, it's either on Goodreads or on Amazon where um, readers chime in, but you're not getting, you know, like professional um, book reviews anymore. And I'm wondering, is that different in Australia? No, well, we, we base everything on you know, the Amazon and the Goodreads as well. And I think it's just become really corrupt. Because you yeah, me too. Yeah, you can't get a, a decent sort of feel for it because you have other people leaving really snarky reviews just to berate the author for whatever reason. You have the ones which we talked about on a couple of shows where you can pay to have a review. They've never read yeah, your book, but you pay oh, them I've never 15 heard bucks. That. That's shocking. Oh, I have to yep. send you a link for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll just make it up. They'll just say, and they're all very generic, saying, oh, this <laughs> is a, you know, seat of your pants book blah 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 and oh, couldn't like, put it down couldn't put it, it down fabulous. yeah oh my god yeah. well i just had an ebook that came out a few months ago and um i checked it on amazon to see how it was going it has two glowing reviews <laughs> both awesome. by my both by my sisters <laughs> so <laughs> but that doesn't count molly that's not the way and they're they're gonna hate the new book because you know i I've used them, as we say. Um, <laughs> they star and <laughs> they star in two different stories in which they don't really come off shining. So I'm going to treasure these book reviews they gave me for this other book, which yeah didn't didn't feature them. <laughs> but I was shocked. I I was just looking and I recognized these names and thought, oh my god. So they're getting. Um, I'm in their debt. Oh, but, there you go. And they're going to be mad at you when you don't reciprocate by by. Did you at least describe them as? being young, thin, and beautiful uh, before you skewered them? Oh, yeah. You always have to say, anybody you're going to skewer, you just say it's breathtakingly beautiful. Right. And then they, right. then they, have, no, they have no way to come back at you because they just right. assume you really saw the real them. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so. This is rubbish, though. I can't find a negative review about you. I tend to do this with our author guests. I go to Amazon and find the worst review they've got. 
You're making it hard. This is unacceptable. <laughs> well, you know, you get student reviews at the end of every semester. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. My very favorite one was, uh, she's okay, but sometimes her eyes glaze over. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sure, it wasn't the actual student. <laughs> so. um, I don't know. See, there's a two-star review for Iron Shoes. But that's Iron, a... shoes? Iron Shoes? Nobody liked Iron Shoes. I did. Uh, what? Is that your novel or is that another Yeah, one? no, that's that's my novel. It never it didn't sell very well. I've got a I'm looking at a copy right here that um I picked them up in used bookstores and it says just so and so with all my love, Molly, on the fly sheet. But um <laughs> <laughs> um it's it's um it's about a very passive a very passive woman and nobody likes passive women. I don't know why, even though most of us are pretty passive. Um, well, Ann Taylor made a whole career out of passive women, so I don't understand that. Well, she makes them charming. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. But I'm just like, sometimes I get, it's like, really, you can't mine's empower this woman anymore? <laughs> no, mine, mine are sort of whiny, but um, they're, very re they're very realistic. Anyhow, I liked, I liked um, getting this novel out. It was... Um, and I, they actually, the one that I just, um, I'm going to mail off to my agent later tonight is a sequel to it. So I'll see, I'm not expecting anything from it. I mean, my, my fort is really the short story. So I wish mm -hmm. I could write a poem. I never did write a poem that was worth hearing. And, um, so <laughs> oh, I, still read, I still read poetry, but increasingly I, 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 uh, I have no desire to write it. Mm. I was, I was big on poetry. It's very dark. I think everyone goes through that phase, probably between oh, the ages of fifteen and twenty-five. It's um, called yeah. youth. Yeah, yeah, youth. And then you you wake up and go, "Oh, that's right. I've got a mortgage and kids." So, <laughs> you know. and poetry is not going to pay the bills. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no, it doesn't doesn't make a lot of money. No. But I like so, poetry workshops because they're so kind to each other. Um, you know, the poetry, the poets have more fun than the prose writers. They have better parties. They have, they're, they're far more interested in sex um, than prose writers because that's their material, sex and death. Yes. And, um, and prose writers are more interested in that mortgage. Um, so, but, uh, but I think that poetry workshops I've been to are just so, they're so gentle with each other. And uh, mainly I think because they don't understand the poems. Everybody is very respectful. But <laughs> and they're afraid to admit they don't understand the process. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Fiction workshops can be sort of savage, as I'm sure you both know. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. So what is, tell me, we've got part of the elements of a, of a good short story, which is to make things, make you see things differently, requires a punchline. Can you, I, I don't know if you have something handy, can you give us a, an example from one of your short stories about that punchline? idea to illustrate that um let's see well you know J james joyce didn't call it a punchline bless him he called it an epiphany but it's <laughs> <laughs> punchline is a lot more direct so mm. <laughs> i'm liking that <laughs> it's essentially the same thing um let's see um we put you on the spot now i know well, i did sorry and we promised little, can i read can i read just a short one from um, yes Okay, oh. this, this is just a, a one-page story I wrote called Bothered, and it is the, the title story in this little chapbook of shorties I put together. And it's a father talking to a son. It's actually based on a conversation I overheard once when I was driving across the country, and I stopped at a diner mm -hmm. in Colorado. I believe it was Father's Day, and a father was sitting uh, with his 10-year-old boy in the booth next to me. And this is essentially what I heard. So the story is called Bothered. I'm sorry you were choosing to act like this today, Kevin. I really am. I'd hoped we could have a nice lunch. That's why I brought you here today, so we could talk man to man. Don't do that with your straw, please. And lift your head. I know you're upset about the dog, and that's too bad. We're all upset. But we don't sniffle and sulk and slouch about it, do we? No, we deal with it. Your mother and I have made a decision about how to deal with the dog, and now you have to make a decision, too. Our decision is that we are going to get rid of her this afternoon. And your decision is you have to accept that. Can you accept that, Kevin? Sit up. The simple reality is that this dog of yours has ruined the house. 
She has peed all over the carpet, and I don't care how quote unquote good you have been about cleaning it up. The fact remains that her pee has saturated the pad underneath. You can smell it. Everyone can smell it. It stinks. Yes, sure, we can put a gate at the bottom of the stairs, and yes, sure, we can put a gate at the top of the stairs, but what good will that do? She scratches. You've heard her. She scratches. Don't do that with your napkin, Kevin. Oh, God. Now what? Tears? Look, guy, this is not my favorite subject either, okay? I don't like having to take your dog to the pound. That's not my idea of a fun afternoon. But you got to face it. This thing just ain't working. Do you understand? You do? You do understand, but you're bothered? Look at me. I said, look at me. What bothers you about it, Kevin? I'll type the so dog. I'm not, I'm not sure that has, you know, quote, unquote, an epiphany. Because a lot of things, that they just come to you. I'm, like most uh, writers, I'm, a, I'm an eavesdropper. Mm. Um, oh yeah. I used, I used to be so curious about what people were really thinking, but that was before the advent of cell phones. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, no. now, now I know what they're thinking and I'm not that interested, but, um, but a conversation, um, uh, between people is almost always worth, um, putting your fork down, <laughs> leaning over the, the booth to hear. Mm. Um, well, I, I, I heard something similar. Uh, well, no, it was a strange, um, oh, what's the term? A strange communication between a woman and her very small child. It probably would have been maybe four, three or four. And kids don't walk very quickly. So she was mar marching forward and she turns around and she goes, would you hurry up? Stop acting so smart. Right. And then the kid sort of waddled up. She goes, oh, for God's sake, I don't really care. You're not my kid as a three o'clock anyway, and go back to your dad. And I went, I'm looking, oh my gosh. At, I'm looking at my apprentice, and he's sort of a bit wide-eyed. And I said, um, I think that kid needs to act a bit smart because <sighs> the IQ of the mother in front is way down. He sort of looks at me like, I think she heard you. <laughs> I, hope she, I hope she did. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, she just went, oh, parent of the year. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it just astounded me. I'm going, yeah. Well, you know. yeah, it would bother you. I mean, it's, you kind of, you, I, there's so many, I agree with you um, that I listen to all sorts of things. And my husband, fortunately, my husband likes to eavesdrop too. So we, you know, we, we play, <laughs> we play the couple's game where we'll, we'll look at a couple, like at you know, a restaurant and he'll lean over and say, okay, it's the second date. And I said, no, 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 it's the third date. And he's so wanting to get lucky. I mean, you know, we, we look at the body language. We look at what's, you know, what they're doing. It's, sometimes it's the first date, it's the exes together. It's fascinating. And you're right. As a, as a writer, you, you want to look at how people, um, what they're saying when they're not saying it. So, right. You know, and that's, the, the, I was just going to say, we're all, such, we're, all such, we're all such cheap dates, you know, it just... <laughs> well, it no, I am. It doesn't take much to entertain a writer, hmm. you know, put us down in a drive-in, you, know, a, a, you know, a McDonald's or a, an airport, I love airports, um, and just let us watch people. Oh, yeah. See, but does it become a little bit creepy? I'm the same, like if we go out to dinner uh, and you do, you see them, the couples walk in, there was one, uh, the last one we are at, and she was in like the tightest item of clothing that I've ever <laughs> seen. And the guy had sort of walked in in like jeans and a sloppy shirt. And she's uh -huh. sitting there and it just struck me as strange. And she's trying to pull like the dress down and like, I'm going, why would you even bother wearing that? It, the brain starts to, but then I think, am I looking at her now? And people are thinking, yeah. look at that weirdo at the other table, looking at that girl pulling her dress down. <laughs> See, you've got, you've, got, you've got a whole short story there with three mm. people. That's interesting, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm like, but hang on, I'm here with my wife, so I don't want her thinking oh, I'm looking at that other woman. Like, oh, this is getting too complicated for my head. I'll just go back to what I was eating. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's good, probably a good I idea. I a good poem out of watching a couple at a, at a museum, and she was the same kind of it, – it's – almost a cliche now, but she, it was definitely a date. She had on her short dress, her high heels. She looked fabulous. He picked up whatever was on the floor and threw it on. And, uh, uh. and I just 
I was so interested in watching them look at the art as they cruised around the room and, and what their reactions and body language was like. It's fascinating. And you're right. I think that that's the kind of thing that for me creates poems and for you creates these good short stories. Yeah. Well, I just like, you know, people are endlessly interesting. I hate no, it if somebody's, awesome. somebody's looking at me. I don't like that at all, but, um, but I like looking at them. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can just wave to them. I do if they're if they're <laughs> particularly interested in looking at me. It's like, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> yes. that's a good idea, Catherine. My <laughs> the the so. work experience kid that I've got, he's taken to waving to cute girls when we drive past. Oh. <laughs> he's only sixteen, and I said to him, "That's adorable." I don't have a problem with you waving at cute girls, but please be mindful that my phone number is plastered all over this, and if they ring, I am handing it to you straight away. Um, That's cute. Waving stopped after that. Now, so with the with the boy and the dog, you know that was you said that so you picked that up off a conversation you heard. Um, right. What did you do? Did you lean over and go, "Wow, is that how yeah. you're telling your kid you're taking the dog to the pound?" I think writers are like photographers. You know, those photographers taking photographs of somebody jumping off the roof rather than saying, "Don't jump." Um, yeah, uh, there's there's just a quality of voyeurism that is satisfied by. Um, I don't think writers are very nice. Mm. Um, you know, if I'd been one of my nicer sisters or my mother, I would have reached over and slapped that man's face. But as a writer, I'm just waiting to see what is he going to say next. What's he going to say next? Give it to me. Give it to me. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, uh, how are you going to get out of this big guy? Let's go. Yeah, yeah. It's it's your problem, guy. I'm just going to report you to the world. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Now we have the that is one of the advantages of being a writer too. It's like, be careful, we'll put you in our books. <laughs> and it, it's one of my problems in almost any situation. I don't. I, I just want to see how it's going to play out. It's curiosity, so I don't. Um, I don't stop a fight. I don't. Uh, you know, I, I just want to see what's going to happen next. And um, maybe not the best attitude. I don't know. But so far. <laughs> So I'm curious though, did you get up and go, oh, I've really got to go? Or did you sit there until they left first? Because you were Of course to... I sat there until they left first. <laughs> <laughs> they had something to do. They had to go kill the dog. All wow. I had to do was get back on the road, right? So yeah, I had to finish writing it all down on my napkin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't reach over and tap them and say, I'm sorry, I missed that word. Could you speak a little louder? I couldn't do that. <laughs> Excuse me, what was the dog's name? <laughs> what was the dog's name? <laughs> I'll buy you a coffee. So, mm. so traveling in Europe is hard. I'm not very good at foreign languages. You know, you can't really, nothing like being in a cafe in Paris with a lover's quarrel, but they're talking in French, damn it. So uh, there's no, you can nothing imagine there. what they're saying. Well, I'm sure it's, it's the same thing we all you say. You did, I did not. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Right. You know, it's just a, you know, we're also. We're also basically flawed in the same ways. Do you so. get do you get, have feedback from you know loved ones that um, you're a bit too critical of people around you because you're sort of trying to pick up on vibes and stories? I'm, my wife says it all the time. She's like, "You're so judgmental of people." I'm like, well, that person's fat with like a whole cart of coke. Like, <laughs> can't they see this? You know, I don't know. I'm always looking well, around. I, I don't even try and defend myself. I mean, because I am judgmental and. Um, and it's not a good thing, and I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you heard it here. The first I, I step is admitting it. I have three daughters. I have three daughters, and the oldest one made me almost sign in blood that I would not write about her anymore because I had anymore. She was a very difficult teenager, which she'll be the first to admit, and she was just a fund of anger and explosions and uh, bad decisions and. Um, uh, she was uh, sort of a writer's dream date, and um, so, and then, and then I, I never wrote about my second uh, daughter, who was watching her older sister, and so she was trying to do the opposite. She wanted to go to a Catholic girls' school and wear a uniform and wouldn't smoke dope, and you know all that stuff. Mm. And well, the oldest one was acting out outrageously, and so the second girl grew up to be a um, a scientist. She's a geneticist and moved. Um, to Amsterdam and is living a perfect life. And um, I was asked to write an article on for a, a collection about grandmothers. And so I was visiting my perfect daughter and her 
brat of a three-year-old, this <laughs> oh, no. granddaughter. And I wrote about the granddaughter and didn't change names because we were supposed to write essays, not fiction. Mm-hmm. And uh, it came out. It was everybody loved it. It was the first story in this collection. My editor thought it was brilliant. I was so proud of it and so stupid that I sent the book to my daughter. <laughs> oh, that was your mistake. <laughs> I I'm still not quite recovered from that. She told me she'd never forgive me. She uh, she she wouldn't let the book in the house. She wouldn't let her husband see it. It was a very loving story, but it was definitely I had captured. My granddaughter, who is now 14 in the love of my life, but at three, we didn't get along. And um, so she asked me, my daughter got me in her kitchen in Amsterdam and said, so why do you write? She said, do you just write to entertain strangers? And I thought, huh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) My family should never read what I write. And uh, this new book that I've got uh, coming out, uh, it's a collection of short stories, and I've dedicated it to the three people it's going to offend the most. I I dedicated it to my my sisters and my brother, adding with love. And my brother won't read it, which is great. He'll put it uh, right by his cookbooks in his kitchen. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And um, my sisters will. And I'm I'm, going to have to... um, swallow a lot of I'm gonna to have to give some really good Christmas presents for yeah, quite a long you're gonna time have to make up for it most definitely yeah. I think I think though dedicating it to them with a complimentary dedication was a nice touch I mean that people um not to get off the subject because we can talk about this at another time but um lots of times early memoir writers are very concerned about using names using you know, should I check with my siblings before I write about this? Should I get a you know a third opinion? And of course, the our answer is you write your own truth and you just do it. And I think that's true on all cases. But there, that's not to say you can't just say, "Oh, but you were fabulous. Thank you so much for cooperating before you even knew you did." <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I like the idea Almost. of um of putting you know dedicating to the people that's gonna. You know, you'd be offended. It's going to piss off the most. I love that idea. That that's was my, that's idea. my idea. I want to do that. I want to put it at the start, you know, thanks to so-and-so. <laughs> it's for, all to your wife. <laughs> always dedicate to your wife. <laughs> Why? No. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I always dedicate to my husband who I know will not read anything because he doesn't want to find himself in the book. He's a clever man. He's a smart guy. He's self-protective. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. He does self-protect. He's very, very good about that. I'll dedicate He's mine so- to the internet. Thank you, internet. <laughs> For distracting me for two years, yes. <laughs> well, most people won't write about their parents till their parents are dead. Um, yeah. I think there's something about writing about uh, mom and dad that is really, really tricky. Um, my students often ask me, you know, can I write about my parents? And I always joke and say, well, that's what God gave them to you for. <laughs> you know, no one else is going to write about them. I mean, they're they're not important to anyone but you. Um, and yes, you should write about them, but try and be as fair, you know, if you're just going to be angry, sometimes in writing about somebody you're, you're angry at, you reach a level of understanding about them that you didn't have before that uh, can lead to forgiveness or t- uh, acceptance, tolerance, all sorts of things. I really believe in, in writing your way out of uh, a narrow-minded uh, approach. I, I don't think writing is redemptive, but I do think that it, it certainly broadens your vision. Hmm. Uh, once you imagine, my mother used to scream at me. She used to say, how would you like to be me? And I think it was one of the best gifts she could have given me because I did think about how would I like to be her, and I wouldn't, but it gave me um, sort of a ticket to empathy. You know, how would I like to be anybody? You know, it was a, it was a gift. Hmm. So be interesting to see how she reacted if you said, I am you. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Like uh, what did uh, Flaubert said that about Madame Bovary? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Apparently. I am Madame Bovary. Yes. Um, yeah. I've got a few mm. other things that we need to carry on with. Um, where can people find you out on the where internet? Where can we find you? Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right here. <laughs> on your website. Here's your answer. On my I website. Do- oh, thank you. <laughs> I was thinking, how how would I find myself? Um, how would I it's, do that? It's just that HTTP, whatever that stands for. What does it stand for? Hot temperature? Hot, um, yeah. it, do, do you really <laughs> want to know? Because I'm the nerd on this show. It's, I would like it. It's hypertext um, oh, something. Oh, I've forgotten now. It was at the tip of my tongue and I got distracted. You'll remember in a minute. Mm. Tell me because I do want to know. I always thought it meant, you know. 
hot time in the old Paris tonight. But Hi, here we go. It's, it's, it's just mollygiles.com. So I do have a website. It's not up to date, needless to say, because my new book that's coming out, um, they have been dicking over the cover for so long that I haven't been able to put out any information on it. Finally, they decided this morning um, it's oh. going to be, I'm going to have a goat on the cover. And <laughs> <laughs> it took them that long to come up with a goat? Yeah. Yeah. Well, goats aren't that, they don't, they don't spring to people's minds that quickly. So, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I gave a goat to my mother-in-law for a Christmas present once. <laughs> I bet she loved it. Well, uh, she asked for it. They're supposed to be darling pets, but I no. don't know quite what this one's doing on the cover of my book. But at this point, the book was due to be published in October. It's coming out later this month, or I guess it, it should be due by March 1st, so it oh, will I have... I feel your pain. So, yeah, that you just like, whatever, put whatever on the cover. <laughs> right? <laughs> Make it black. Get it out. And the, the, the title, All the Wrong Places, uh, I was listening to NPR two days ago, and I was listening to a, <laughs> an author talk about oh, his memoir about his brother who committed suicide, and the, the book is called All the Wrong Places. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> So, so the, I think my collection. I had I I called them right away, the publishers, and said, please put you know stories, not a searing memoir of a brother's suicide, um, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> so anyhow, we'll we'll be uh, on the same bookshelf together. I hope at some point. Anyhow, it doesn't matter if you like this, you're going to love this, says Amazon. <laughs> right, right. When a book gets accepted or a story gets accepted, you're so thrilled, and then the actual production and everything can can sort of wear you down but oh yeah i, I agree 100 percent. i i and i say that when people you know i get authors who say oh i just want to be published i just want to be published i just want to be published and, and i do point out to them it's like you know i just got to tell you the good time is the writing and the really crappy time is the publication part you know and the best time is what i'm going through now is when i've finished the the revision of the revision of the revision and i'm going to send it off i, I that's the best time you know it truly is the yeah. best time because it hasn't yeah. been you know kicked under the wheels yet it, it will be i have no hopes for this book but um <laughs> the but hopeless just, manuscript go go be free <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm just glad to be finished with it and that i think is the satisfaction of it so yeah yeah i agree I, it's the like because oh, i just finished a draft of a novel yeah. and it's like oh okay and then I give myself a couple of days before I start thinking about what's wrong with it. I mean, you, exactly. you at least get a moment. <laughs> I don't Please. mind. I know what's wrong with it. I hate it when other people go to pains to tell me what's wrong with it in detail. But oh, I'll, I can get that I'm raised, raised to that. Yeah. 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 Well, yes. Well, make sure, don't put like a sheep on the front of that book and <laughs> market it in New Zealand because it, okay. it'll end up in the erotic section. Yes, it will. Um, uh, no, don't worry. <laughs> Just, just yeah. Hypertext transfer protocol. That's what it stands for. Harvard there you go. We love Harvard. Google. One more time. Harvard text. What? Hyper. <laughs> Harvard text. No. Hyper text transfer protocol. Oh, I liked Harvard text so much better. Huh. Okay. Yeah, but that'd be more pretentious though. <laughs> okay. Well, now I know what it is, and I'm disappointed. It's not as interesting as it could be, but it's not still true. Not as sexy as it could be. No, 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 well, no, 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 no. It's been awesome. I like speaking of covers. I really mm -hmm. like the um, the little logo you've got on the newbie writers podcast with that lovely feather swirling around. That's pretty. Did you two did you two do that yourself? Yeah, Damien did that. Yeah, I came up with that. Um, well, next book, I I'm sending it to you, Damien. I need oh, help for a cover. Awesome. <laughs> well, don't. It's going to end up with a llama on the front. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all, all the wrong animals. Anyway, um, my first book had a dog on the front, and um, uh, yeah, so maybe that's it's a stylized dog. It's a, like a dancing stylized yeah, dog. It's, it's a nice dog. dog. It's much much nicer than the goat. We could do a greatest <laughs> hits. We could do Molly Giles's Menagerie and just have all these animals on the front. <laughs> menagerie of short stories. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we've be great. we've got stuff to do. Okay, um, so We've got stuff, other, so a couple other things to do. You're welcome to stay with us, Molly, or if you need to take off to go to something exciting this afternoon, by all means, you can do that too. Well, well, I, I just want to thank you both. I probably will continue listening to you, but I'm, I'm, I'm signing off. And oh, um, okay, thank you so much. It was really a delight. Well, good, thank, thank you for inviting me. Strive for that. You do. You succeeded. We tried. Now. <laughs> 
prompt. Talk to you later. All right. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Prompt. Let's do a prompt. Let's do a prompt. So here's, I, I, was, I was feeling, I don't know, fanciful. So if you were to furnish your ultimate tree house, mm. what would you include? TV. What is the perfect, and along those lines, what is the perfect hideaway for a small treehouse sized child? Mm. And while you're at it, what's the perfect hideaway right now? Um, the cellar. No. Um, <laughs> That's only because it's cool right now for you. <laughs> yeah, right. What's the perfect hideaway for a small child? The cellar, the basement. No, that's creepy. Um, if you were to finish the ultimate treehouse. Yeah, yeah, the ultimate treehouse. Now, you can go on Pinterest or you can go on um, Howes, both those magazines that come. And there's some, I, I saw one treehouse that a grandparents built for their grandchildren that was unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's this gorgeous, multi-roomed, fantasy castle and you'd love it it looks like something out of your book mm. um, or is it just you know a bunch of crates banged together and i think the whole point is to have a place that is a all of yours and be far away from the grown-ups you see if i was to do something like that i'd have my wife who works for local government say do we need to get council approval for that yeah exactly so you need permits we've talked about that yeah. Why do you need plumbing in the treehouse? Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't know. It'd have to have They don't want to keep TV. coming down off of the, down the ladder to go to the bathroom. Yeah, TV, internet connection, and probably in the shortest tree I could find. So <laughs> Closest to the ground you could get. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What would you put in there? I would put in um, a skylight and a great big comfortable couch and lots of lots of pillows and lots of uh, blankets and a whole bunch of books. And I could just sit up there and not have anybody disturb me while I was, as we say in my family, leave me alone. I'm almost finished with the book. Ah. Well, I will also add to this just from an Australian's point of view. Have you seen the spiders we get in our trees? <laughs> I'll stay in my home. Thank you very much. We have much smaller spiders. They're deadly. Some of them are deadly, but not, not on the scale. No. And, well, actually, that reminds me. I've got to bring our pest control and have the spiders killed again. Um, <laughs> oh. Hey, yeah, it got bad. We had like two or three in the house a day. Ooh, Just, and they're big. I mean, they're you know, do you, you lasso them and Julian rides them around the house? Or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we heard them and, you know. Oh, God, you could hear them? Yeah. That's terrible. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway. Do a word of the week. Word of the week. Um, this is from Arlene Miller from her Weird and Wonderful Words series at bigwords101.com. Uh, Ventripotent? Mm -hmm. mm. With great capacity or appetite for food. Oh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> there you go. I thought of you. Mm. Except with the, well, I've got capacity to eat the food, but it just seems to go nowhere. Um, I envy that. I think a lot of. I'm sure Sharon does. God damn it! You need to. You need to gain weight. Mm, well, like I said, I did say to my. Um, I call him my apprentice. It's my work experience boy. He said to me mm -hmm. yesterday when I picked him up, he goes, "How are you?" I said, "One step away from morbidly obese." <laughs> he looked at me and went, "What?" I said, "I try." <laughs> my mother-in-law, who was who was at five one and three quarters or you know so you're just a small rounder woman mm -hmm. um she was an and brilliant woman and she was at a professional conference walking down the hall with these two guys who were you know all dressed up in their suits and all up into themselves and um they were talking about food or weight or something and she turns to one of them she says well i am a recovering anorexic i'm doing well don't you think <laughs> jeez so I thought, oh, that's good. Good line, fast. We like it. Yes, but the, th the problem is people, I'll get to that in a minute. People seem to think I'm faster than I am. And just <laughs> yes, let's get to that. Mm, put it this way I'm so skinny, I'm basically see through. Anyway, uh, let's do a tortured sentence. Next time, don't put the wrong farces on the rocket slab. <laughs> Sentences. 
that was that was Molly in a cafe, uh, <laughs> leaning over to something. Writing it all down. Yeah. Um, this comes from New American Poets of the 80s, uh, edited by Jack Myers and Roger Weingarten. I don't care about. Uh, Heather, Heather McHugh was born and raised on both coasts and attended Radcliffe College. So she was born in two places at once. How does that work? Yep. Yep, and raised on two places at once. Pretty good trick. Cool. I didn't know they had 3D printing in 1948. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I love that. And I just read, I read a whole, along those lines, I read a whole article in the New Yorker this week on the um, Oxford comma and how, and believe me, that's how nerdy I am as I read an entire article devoted to the comma. Mm. Uh, the controversy is the Oxford comma is as many commas as you can throw into a sentence. And a, a number of us and myself and in, I'm included in this were dropping commas and not using them before the word and, and should be the separator. But I understand for some sentences, um, you need to have that second comma so that you don't do some really crazy stuff. So I'll pull some of those sentences for tortured sentences that they show in the, uh, in the New Yorker article. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Because it'll be painful. Um, I always forgot to ask Molly if there was anyone she wanted to give a shout out to. I don't know well, if she's still that's, there. That's okay. So let's talk about um, the, uh, the upcoming guest and the shout out because the story is published. Yes. Um, I blanked out from it. I'm having a drink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. It, it's the heat. It's the heat, yeah. Let's put it down on that. So Nathan Weaver... Is a he's an author. I don't know if we can call him a newbie author. I guess we could. He probably wouldn't care yeah. for that. Um, he's got this little thing going, which I thought was such a cool idea. So you, for five dollars, you can donate to him through Fiverr. That also that other place that does those reviews. But uh, you can uh, yeah, for five dollars. Yeah. Yes, you can pay him five dollars, and he'll write a short story where he kills you, um, which I did get and was killed in a very interesting way. Put it yes, down. you were. I liked it. Yeah, it was It was really good. So I'm going to try and have him on the show soon. Uh, what's it? March. End of March Actually, sometime. I'm going to have him in March on March 21st because I'm going to be um, – I'm, I'm on a road trip driving all of my – all of my youngest child's stuff up to his new house, which includes lots of science fiction books and a complete Nintendo collection throughout the ages. Wow. wow. Um, yes, I hope to maybe, I don't know, act out a little bit of my short story. There's a, there's a bit of dialogue between me <laughs> and, <laughs> and someone else. So, yeah, I think that'll be fun to do. I think it's a cool concept. I like when authors do something a little bit different on – just on the outskirts, it's only $5. He's not exactly making a living off of this, but it's just another no, it way. Is, it's super entertaining. Yeah, it's like a prompt. And there's yeah. there's certain rules and requirements with it. So, you know, we pay $5. He's got to get it done in seven days. It gives him the deadline. And this is what I want to talk to him about. But uh, look up Nathan Weaver. Uh, I've, I'll grab his website. I think I can find it quickly. But, yeah, it was it was weird. It was weird to be able to sort of read yourself. And he asked me questions about in my height, how much do I weigh? <laughs> All <this sort> of <laughs> stuff. Um, which for the record, I put down that, uh, yeah, I was 83 kilos. And his response was, oh, I thought it was more like, you know, it was over 200 pounds. No. And I'm going, whoa. <laughs> so, no, yeah. that's what cracked me up. So I re when I read the story, it's like, the the line was he looked to be about two hundred pounds. I thought no no he doesn't look to be about two hundred pounds. <laughs> yes, so, so that's enter that was an entertaining glitch. I like that. Yes, but then I ran up past someone else, and I said just if you look at that YouTube video because I know the camera puts on ten pounds. Uh, <laughs> if you look at that YouTube video, you know how now how what size do you think I am? And they came back on, oh, yeah, you know, 90 to 100 kilos. I went, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> Puts on more than more than 10 pounds. And, like, I, look, for years I was so emaciated. I just wanted to be huge and mm -hmm. tried to get to that stage. And now people think I am sort of getting a bit sort of weighty. It's good. I finally need to stop trying. 
There you uh, go. Check out check out Nathan Weaver. He's got a website, talesfrombabylon.com. It was uh, very cool. Give him five bucks. He'll kill you. And kill yourself on paper. Yeah, and actually, just on that, someone thought he had to clarify. <laughs> someone on Google, there's <laughs> always one on Google, I tell you. I, yeah, I was talking to him and someone's like, so I, I read to the end of the story and then, and then I sort of realised that it was a fiction piece. <laughs> and I, I'm like, Woo! hmm. So to Nathan, that's a lot of effort for five bucks if you're going to write something and then really kill them. Um, yeah. <laughs> Stupid people on the internet. Now, uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to a podcast, an Adelaide podcast. You don't get too many of them, and it's sort of right up my snarky alley. It's called Another Boring Thursday in Adelaide. So check out boringadelaide.com.au. And my brother-in-law was on there. I must uh, check the actual, you know, show out. But I saw a little sort of bit of it, and it was just, yeah, it's snarky. It's good. Good. Uh, Those are fun. And Adelaide is boring, let's be honest. I liked Adelaide. It's boring. Boring. Okay. I liked it. Boring. Got it. <laughs> mm, I don't know. All right. So next week we have Naomi Rose, who is a, um, a coach and an author. And that's... That's all, I'm, that's all I got. So we'll find out more when we talk with her. <laughs> like I'm not going to preview too much. No, don't do that. There's no fun in that whatsoever. Is there anyone you want to give a shout out to? I didn't think we did that last week. Well, we didn't have a show. Um, did I talk about success freaks? Only marginally. You said they didn't earn any money. So that's just you know awesome for our relationship well, let me with them. follow up after saying they didn't earn any money. Maybe they do now. But um, I was um, cruising around um, blog. Blog talk radio, I yeah, think. I was, right. a, I was on a blog, I was on a um, podcast site, and they, Success Freaks, was on the top of the list. They were the number one, they were the number one podcast for that week. So I sent Charles a little note that says, I saw him as number one and, and said, Yay. So let's give them, they're doing really well. So shout out to Success Freaks. Yes. Well, check them out. They are, they're finally being successful. So at least their podcast is working. <laughs> well, they've been successful for a while, and I think that they're going to the New Media Expo in April and and speaking, and they're mm. they're they really have gained some traction. I'm I'm quite happy for them. Yeah, it's good. And actually, I think the nominations for the podcast awards come out uh, next week. Oh, Monday. very cool. Monday or Tuesday. So yeah, we'll do that. Let's see if we made the long list. <laughs> we're gonna get shortlisted. If the long list would be great. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we're in the sort of sort of Z grade podcast. Yeah. Section. Oh well, that's fine. It doesn't bother me. So yes, we'll continue to say what we want. That's part of the charm. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, All right. And just quickly, because I'm about to sign off uh, to the person that's listening. Hello, what is going on, man? Um, our show is going on. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and you've reached the end of the show now. So congratulations. Uh, you can go back to the start and listen. So. Until next week. We'll Until next you week. Your book starts here on the Newbie Writers Podcast.